Hi, welcome to the first lesson for microeconomics. And uh, this this is going to be the first of many videos that I'm going to do that um, that is going to take a simple diagram. And um, I'm going to use a simple diagram to, as a starting point to explain the concepts that you need to know in H2 microeconomics. Okay, so today the first thing that I'm going to, the first diagram that I'm going to look at is the production possibility curve. So what is it? What can we learn from it? And four key concepts you can take away from it today. So now let's look at an example of a production possibility curve. It's a very simple diagram, okay? And uh, basically, you have the y axis, which is con, and the x axis, which is u. Or it can be any two goods, really. And uh, the units are quantities of con and quantities of u. So what, it de what the production possibility diagram depicts is basically the different combination of this, the different combinations of these two goods that a country can produce given its amount of resources. So what does this mean? Okay, basically if you look at this line here, any point along this line, pardon me that it is not very smooth, just assume that it, it is actually a smooth curve. Any point along this curve can be produced by this country or let's say in some cases a firm. And um, basically the firm can choose to produce any point on this line. Okay, It can also produce any point within under this curve. Okay, Because that is within its production possibility limits. However, if it were to produce that, it would not be very efficient because it's not making full use of its available resources. However, it cannot produce any point that's outside of the curve. And why is that so? Well, simply because it has limited resources. Well, just, just imagine that, you know, if let's say here the firm or the country has unlimited resources, it would be able to produce unlimited amounts of corn and unlimited amounts of wool. Okay, and that that would defeat the purpose of economics. Because as you will see on the next slide, the key concept, the first key concept that we are about to learn is scarcity. Economics is the science of scarcity. Basically, we are trying to measure or we are trying to find out how can we actually use limited resources to satisfy satisfy unlimited ones. Okay, the idea that resources that we have and are in a in in a in a in a moment, I'll explain what resources are. The idea that the resources that we have are unable, they are unable to produce goods and services to satisfy unlimited ones. So we have to find a way around this problem. We have to find a way to use whatever that we have to satisfy as much or as many ones as we can. And what is the best way to do so? That is the question that microeconomics is asking. So what are resources? Resources are there are four types of resources: land, labor, labor, capital, enterprise, or entrepreneurship. So what are what is land? Examples of land can be actual land or it can be natural resources in general. So basically, farmers can use this land to grow crops, you can sell the crops for a profit, and so on and so forth. Then, these farmers, they pay rent to the landlord. Hence, the person who owns the land, the person who owns the resources, receives rent for it. So as you can see, we have rent, wages, interest, profit. So all these are actually what the person who owns the resource receives for actually renting out the resource to an employer or someone who makes use of the resource to produce something to a producer okay so the next one is labor so someone who rents out labor will receive wages in return the next is capital capital here doesn't refer to financial capital okay it could refer to financial capital if we wanted it to okay if we if we if we added the word financial ahead of, in front of it however in most of most of the times ec economies are actually referring to physical capital such as machinery, such as inventories or let's say capital goods, factories and so on. Okay? So those are physical capital and they earn interest or in some cases we can call it rent as well. And uh, lastly, we have enterprise or entrepreneurship, which is the this person that actually sets up this company or this firm to produce something, to gather all these available resources to produce something and what he earns in return for his service to
to society to himself is profit. Okay, and um, now let's look at the diagram again. So, as you can see here, this diagram is a downward sloping curve, and what you can notice is actually that at each point of the curve, okay, it starts out at, with a gradient that's less steep and it proceeds on with a gradient that's steeper as we move along the x-axis, which, x -axis, which is the amount of wool that we are producing. So I've made a critical assumption here. And uh, so what actually can you observe here? Give it a bit of thought before I move on to the next slide. All right. So the next concept that I'm going to talk about, which is the opportunity cost. So opportunity cost is the cost of the next best alternative foregone. So as you can see from this diagram previously, okay, in order to produce to, to produce 200 units of corn, you have to sacrifice 100 units of wool. Conversely, to produce 100 units of wool, you have to sacrifice 200 units of corn. So you can say that the opportunity cost of producing 200 units of corn is actually 100 units of wool. Okay, notice I'm not talking in terms of prices. There's no price here. Okay, and um, what else can you notice from this diagram, which is that the assumption that, that I have made? Okay, the fact that the gradient of the curve changes as we move along the x axis means that the opportunity cost of producing corn or wool is actually changing as you produce more corn or more wool. Now, why could that be the case? Well, simply put, there are a few reasons that could be, that could, that, that could be the case. Okay, basically, as you produce more wool, you will start to employ more and more resources that were used to actually produce corn in the first place. And definitely, some of these resources are not going to be suitable. Okay, What you used to produce corn is capital goods, is machinery, is labor. It's not going to be suitable for producing wool. And hence, they are not perfectly compatible resources. So, in other words, the more you try to produce wool, the less compatible these resources are, the less efficient these resources will be in producing wool. And hence, the number of units that you, or corn that you, that you need to sacrifice to produce an additional unit of wool increase, increases. Hence, we have an increasing opportunity cost, as shown by the steep, increasing steepness of the curve. Okay? And... Uh, Another reason could be that basically as you try to add more labor to fix units of capital, as you try to add, let's say you are a store owner and you and you are producing um pizzas. Okay, as you hire more and more labor, you only have one oven. And there will come a point of time your kitchen gets so congested that you cannot possibly the effect of hiring one additional unit of labor is not going to increase the number of pizzas that you can produce. Per, per per day okay and uh, so there's this effect coming in here as well which I will go into greater detail in future lessons because that is also a very important concept of economics and the third thing I'm going to look at is relative prices so just take note about this concept okay it's just that microeconomists talk about trade-off in terms of relative prices so for example the price of one apple computer could be let's say 300 Fuji apples okay and uh, that, that, that is what we are concerned about. We are not so much concerned about um, we're not so much concerned about the actual price of the good, but we are more concerned about how much we are sacrificing in terms of another good when we produce something. Okay? Even though in some cases we can convert all this into a do into a dollar value into a common currency to compare, but that is still thinking from the frame of mind where we are looking at relative prices, not absolute prices. Okay? And um now, a slightly different diagram. Angela and Betty. Okay. They Angela can produce 200 units of corn or 100 units of wool. Betty can produce 100 units of corn or 150 units of wool. Okay. So the opportunity cost of Angela um is that the opportunity cost of her producing one unit of wool or oh, sorry, one 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 unit of corn is actually 0 0.5 units of wool. And the opportunity cost of Betty producing one unit of wool is 0 0.75 units of corn. So watch what happens when Angela and Betty agree to trade with one another at a rate of one is to one. Okay, basically you can see that 
Betty's production possibility curve, which is this line here, and the consumption possibility curve, which is this line here, are different. Okay, normally the two are the same, but when trade is possible, the consumption possibility is expanded. Because right now, let's say Angela decides to produce 200 units of corn, okay, and Betty decides to produce 150 units of wool, okay, and so what happens is then they can trade with one another at a rate of 1 is to 1. So now Angela can consume at any point that is on this line here. Okay, and Betty can consume at any point on this line. So you can see that trade actually expands their consumption possibilities. Okay, so this is one important idea that we will look at in future lessons as well. But just bear in mind right now. Okay, so now for a quick summary. The production possibility curve tells us the different combination of goods that a firm or a country can produce. Okay, and uh, the second thing, second key concept, economics is a, is a study of scarcity, of how to use limited resources to satisfy unlimited ones. Next key concept, opportunity cost. It's the next best, it's the next best alternative for gone. So in this case, in the production possibility diagrams that we've been look looking at, the opportunity cost of producing the good on the y-axis is the amount of good that you sacrifice on the x-axis, vice versa. And the last point is that trade can potentially make everyone better off. I say potentially because there are certain assumptions that have to be present for that to be the case, and we'll look at it in future lessons as well. So join me in your next lesson, okay? Because now we have only looked at what governs production. What are the limitations that we have? Basically, firms are limited by their resources. Okay, they have limited resources. And but in this case, we have not answered how do we decide what to produce, okay, and how much to produce actually. None of those things we have learned today tell us how much corn or how much wool each firm should produce. Okay, so these questions are unanswered, and these are actually what more the important questions in economics. You want to know how to produce, how much to produce, okay, and and what what combination of goods and services do we actually want to produce? Well, that that brings in another dimension of microeconomics, which is the consumption function, because what you want to produce depends on what consumers want, what consumers need, okay? If consumers need one good more than another, you want to produce more of that good because you can sell it for a higher price, okay? And so on and so forth. So we look at it later on. And uh, until then, brief economics. <laughs>